morning we're going to continue in John's gospel and we're going to begin in verse 18 of John chapter 15. And again, I would just um, <laughs> ask you to just take this in as I read it. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he says is true. We need to be able to see things the way he tells us that they are. And again, I would uh, submit to you that the world has not changed since the days of our Lord Jesus. Okay, this is what he says to his disciples. Remember, in the upper room, uh, the, the night in which he would be betrayed before they would go out to the garden where he would pray and he would uh, be met by the soldiers and they would take him into custody. These are the last moments he had with his disciples before those things happened and he was speaking to bring them comfort. And ultimately, this is meant to give us comfort and encouragement. So this is what Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my Father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I'm just going to back up a bit and, and remind you that last time Jesus was explaining that our relationship, if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ... Our relationship to him is as that of branches to a vine. Jesus is the vine. He is the one who is the source of life, the source of our life. The one who gives the Holy Spirit, who brings spiritual life. And of course, we are the branches. Those who are connected to him by faith. Those who have received that rich sap of the vine, the Holy Spirit, and who continue to receive it from Him on a daily basis, or at least we ought to be going to Him on a daily basis. As we saw on Wednesday, we ought to be seeking the Lord in secret prayer, drawing the strength we need from Him in order to do His work so that we can do what He has called us to do, so we can bear fruit. The fruit which Jesus says brings glory to the Father. He is glorified when our light shines by bearing the, the fruits of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fruits of righteousness, the fruits that prove to the world that Jesus is the Messiah and that we actually belong to Him, that fruit that brings to us, as we saw last week as well, a greater sense of His love, that, that He loves us and that fills our hearts with the same kind of joy that Jesus had when He glorified His Father in the same way by doing what the Father had called him to do through his obedience. Now, we also saw that being connected to Jesus and having his Spirit dwelling within us also gives us the power 
to love one another. You know, Jesus commands us to do several things in Scripture, but the beauty of Christianity is, and what our Lord does, is He actually gives us the ability. He gives us the power to do what He calls us to do. Well, Jesus, in giving us this connection to Him and giving to us His Holy Spirit, gives us the power to love one another as Jesus loved us. This, as a matter of fact, was the very thing that Jesus pointed to earlier as the way that the world would be able to recognize us as His disciples. He says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Jesus gives, that, gives us that ability to love one another, and that loving of one another is the witness that He desires we give that will prove to the world that we are His disciples. And of course, if we're His disciples, He must be the Messiah. Now, this morning, Jesus tells us that as we show Him our love by bearing this fruit, and as we love one another, as He calls us to do, this is going to bring another response from the world. They're not only going to be able to look at us and know that we're Jesus' disciples, but as they recognize us as Jesus' disciples, they will hate us. Now, I'm not saying, by the word, the word Jesus uses here is a rather strong word. They will despise us. And it may perhaps have a better application to the Jews in those days, yet if we shine the light of Christ... This is how the world will respond in varying degrees. Now, Jesus explained this hatred that the world had toward him earlier to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, and he also told us here why the world hates him. He says to Nicodemus, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Jesus is telling Nicodemus he is the light. He comes into a dark world and the darkness does not love the light. The world hated Jesus because of the light that he was shining. Through the words that he spoke, through the things that He did. Now, if we are connected to Him as a branch to the vine, if His Spirit is flowing through us, that same light is going to be shining from us. And so the world is going to hate us as well. Well, I want you to notice here that Jesus, because He loves us as His children, because He cares for us so deeply, He wants us to know that this will happen so that when it does happen, so that when we do what He commands and we shine His light and we have to face the world's hatred, the world's ire, He says, I tell you these things so that you may be kept from stumbling, so that you're not shocked, fall away, you know, tempted to leave the Lord Jesus Christ because now suddenly you have this great price you have to pay. Well, that's what I want us to consider this morning. Now, first of all, Jesus wants us to know that if we belong to Him, far from promoting our popularity in this world, we will be hated. We have to reckon on that. He says in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, on the surface, it appears as though Jesus is really leaving this question open as to whether or not the world is really going to hate us or not hate us when He says, if the world hates you. But we do need to understand in the original language, it's not really a question of if. Jesus is not saying if, but He's saying since the world hates you. He's saying when the world hates you. He's not talking about something that's possible. He's talking about something that is real something that we have to face. If we belong to Jesus, the world will hate us. Now, by the world, Jesus, of course, is not talking about this planet. You know, the planet's not going to hate us. He's not talking about the cosmos, the universe that He created, because those are two different ways, of course, the world is used. 
And he's not just talking about the world system that we have to face that is constantly tempting us to sin, but what he's talking about are the people of this world, the people who are a part of this world, the people who follow the God of this world, Satan, in the same way that we used to when we belong to this world. He's talking about those who do not belong to him, those that he hadn't chosen and called out of the world, or those whom he had chosen but had not yet called out of the world. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. In terms of the vine and the branches, these are the branches that are not connected to the vine. They are the ones who are part of the world. They are the ones that don't bear good fruit. They are the ones that bear only bad fruit. Now, Jesus is saying, if we were not connected to the vine and we were bearing the same kind of bad fruit that these other branches not connected to the vine were bearing, then those branches would love us. Jesus says the world loves its own. The world loves those that are just like it. But because Jesus chose us and called us out of the world, because He graciously gave His life for us to cleanse us from our sins, that He might connect us to Himself, that He might fill us with His Spirit and fill us with His love, because we now speak the same truth that He speaks and show the same kind of love that he showed to the world, now the world hates us. Now here we need to ask this question. Does that mean the world's going to hate us all the time? Does that mean that we should expect them to throw rocks at us when we walk down the street? I remember hearing a, a, a case about this. There was this uh, show that was made years ago on television, Rich Man, Poor Man. There was this guy who played a bad guy, and he played it so well. He played the part so well, he was so despicable that when he walked down the street, people threw rocks at him, I mean, at the actor, you see, not, not at the real character. He wasn't really that character. Is Jesus telling us that we're going to be despised and hated just as we walk down the street? People are going to sneer at us, you know, gawk at us, throw things at us. No, that's not what he's saying. And this is why. The world is not going to treat us like that unless they know there is a difference between them and us. As long as they think there's no difference between us, they will treat us like anyone else. It's only when they see the light shining from us, when we're living according to God's Word, when we're sharing the gospel with them, when we're warning them about God's judgment, when we tell them they're doing something that is wrong, something that is sin, something that God says that He will judge, that's when they will hate us because that is the light. Because this light, as Jesus said earlier, exposes their evil. Jesus says the world is going to hate you. If you shine that light, they're going to hate it because they love evil and they do not love what is good. They do not love what is right. Now, should we be surprised by this? Well, not really, because Jesus says this is how they responded to Him. And I just would submit to you, read the Bible, read the Gospels, and you'll see that Jesus was not loved by the world. Jesus was hated. And look again what He says in verse 18. If the world hates you, or since it hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. I mean, think about how Jesus was treated. Yes, there was the time of popularity. He had large crowds following him, but there was still a majority of, of Israel that hated him. How many times did his enemies attack him verbally? How many times did they argue against him? How many times did they try to arrest him outside the city in order that they might kill him? Well, many times that, that's what the Gospels tell us. And why did they treat him in that way? What is it that Jesus did that was so bad? Well, really all he did was tell them the truth. You know, and sometimes the truth hurts, doesn't it? He preached the gospel. He graciously healed their sicknesses. Many people he set free from 
demon possession. Uh, he loved them. That's what he did. He loves them as a shepherd loves his sheep. I mean, Jesus is the shepherd of Israel, and the sheep rejected him. So Jesus loved them, and in return, they hated him. And this is even more remarkable when you consider who it is these people were. These were his own people. These were the people of God. John writes in John chapter 1, verse 11, regarding Jesus, He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive Him. It's talking about His ministry among the Jews. Jesus said, the world will hate you, but the world He's talking about here is the world in the church, the world among Israel, among the old covenant people of God, among His own people. Now, Jesus said, if they're going to treat me this way, you can be sure they're going to do the same thing to you. He says in verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Jesus says, however they're going to treat me is the way that they will treat you. If they love Jesus, they're going to love you. If they hate Jesus, they're going to hate you. And they're going to hate you for the same reason that they hated Him. Remember, it's His image that is being formed in you. You're becoming like Jesus by His Holy Spirit. And the more you become like Him, the more you will be treated just like Him. Now, again, why did the world hate Him? Why did His own people hate Him? The Old Testament church the natural children of Abraham, why did they treat Jesus in this way? Well, I've already told you it's because he was shining the light, but Jesus gives us another reason. It's because they didn't know his Father. Listen to what he says in verse 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. Now, it's not that they didn't know who this one was. Remember who it is that sent Jesus? It was the God of the Jews, the one that they worshipped, the one they said they loved. They knew who he was. They knew his name. They knew what he had done for them. They knew how he had loved them. He knew how, they had, how, how God had adopted them as his children when he made that covenant with their father, Abraham. They knew what God had promised them, that He was going to send them the Messiah. They knew all these things about Him. They knew about God, but Jesus says they did not know Him. Now, again, the word He's using here is not referring to just knowledge about Him. It's talking about the fact that they didn't love Him. They didn't have a saving relationship with Him. They didn't know Him personally. The fact that they rejected Jesus was the proof that they didn't know the Father because they would have, if they had loved the Father, if they really had loved Him, they also would have loved His Son because the Son is just like the Father. Remember Jesus said, or He came down to reveal the Father, to explain Him to us in terms that we can understand. It's one thing to read about God, you know, and just hear about what He's like, but it's another thing to see Him come down in human flesh and actually live among us so we can see how He speaks, see what He says, see how He responds. Well, Jesus says that He is just like the Father, and to see Him is to see the Father. Remember what Jesus said to Philip. When Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father, and that's enough for us, Jesus. Jesus responded to him in John 14, verse 9, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now remember, Jesus is not saying there that He is the Father, but that He and the Father are so much alike. I mean, they're exactly alike, except they're different persons of the triune God, but they share exactly the same attributes, so to see one is to see the other. And when the Jews saw Jesus... And they hated Jesus. They were actually guilty of hating their own God, the God they said that they loved. And that's what Jesus says in verses 22 through 24. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. 
but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my Father as well. You see, Jesus came to explain the Father. He revealed the Father in the way that He lived, the things that He spoke, the things that He did. They saw Him. They hated Him. And so they hated the Father as well. Now, Jesus, when He says this, is not saying that if He hadn't come, they would not be guilty of any sin. They would still have broken His commandments and be guilty of those sins, but they would not have been guilty of the sin of hating and rejecting Him and His Father at the same time. Now, I do want you to, to realize how evil sin is. I mean, let's, let's understand this response of theirs to Jesus is sin, and it's evil. And I want you to see how evil sin really is because they hated Him. For what reason? Because He was just like God, because He loved them, because He told them the truth, the truth about their condition, the truth about what God will do to those who don't repent, but also the truth about what God was doing through His Son to save sinners, what He was about to do through Him to save all who would trust Him from judgment and bring them safely to heaven. That's why they hated Jesus, and they also hated Him, at least the leaders did, because they saw Him as a threat to their leadership. They wanted their clout with Rome, they wanted their authority, they wanted their power, and they thought Jesus was going to take it away from them. So they hated this one who loved them so much. They hated this one who was the Son of God, the one they claimed to love. Now in doing this, they were doing exactly what God said they would do many years ago which further proved that Jesus was, in fact, God's Son. In verse 25, Jesus said, But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They had no reason to hate Jesus. They had every reason to love Jesus, but they hated Him without a cause. That is what sin does. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. It responds in, in a very negative way towards something that is very, very good something that is absolutely perfect. They hated Jesus, but they had no cause to hate Him. And of course, when the world hates us, they should also have no cause to hate us. Jesus says they're going to hate us because we're shining the same light of love that Jesus shone. Now finally, why was Jesus telling His disciple these things? Why was He warning them about the fact that the world was going to hate them? Well, He did this so that when it happened, because it wasn't going to be if, but when, they wouldn't be stumbled by it. Look at what he says in, in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples in this way, is also warning us, telling us in advance how the world is going to respond to us so that when they do, we will not be stumbled by it either, so that we won't be tempted to fall away, to, to jump ship, to say, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I wanted the, you know, popularity. I wanted the health and wealth. You know, I wanted to be able to ask God for whatever I want. He was going to do it and make my life so easy. Now, Jesus says that's not the way it's going to be. He tells us so we won't be tempted to fall away. It's not easy to be hated really by anyone. Even if you have one person who hates you, that's hard. Isn't that? That's hard to, to endure. But what about a, a large group of people? What about the majority of the world? Well, how do you get ready for something like that? Well, being warned in advance is one way. Now, again, I've already told you, Jesus did not promise us an easy road. It's not an easy road. It's not like, you know, I've, <laughs> like I've, I've seen, you know, caricatured some 
uh, army recruiters or navy recruiters, you know, just sign up, we'll give you a condo by the beach, and we'll, we'll, we'll do, you know, give you all this money, this high salary, people are going to respect you, and, you know, all these positive things, you know, they paint it in such a positive way. Well, Jesus didn't tell us the road would be easy. He didn't paint it that way. He didn't promise us the condo. He didn't promise us the money. He didn't say we're going to be respected and admired by all of our neighbors if we follow him. But what he told us we could expect would be difficulty. It would, the cost would be, would be high and that we must be willing to pay that price if we're even going to pick up our cross and begin to follow him. On one occasion, Jesus said these words to the crowds that were following him in Luke 14, 26 through 35. And you tell me, does he sound to you like a recruiter that's painting this beautiful picture so that people will come in and really not know what they're getting into? This is what Jesus says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters... Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let me just pause for a moment and realize Jesus, of course, is not literally telling us to hate them, but by comparison to our love for him, we would leave them behind and we would do what he calls us to do. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough? To complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still far away? He sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus tells us that if we're going to follow Him, we have to follow Him on these terms. He tells us what it's like in advance so that we can count the cost because this is the cost regardless of what we think the cost may be. And if we get into the middle of it and then find out we have to pay it, we may be like the person who started to build the tower but didn't really calculate on what we needed and we weren't able to finish. We'll give up before we complete the journey. Well, Jesus also tells us that we can't expect people to like us. We can't expect people to applaud us. But what we can expect is for people to hate us. Now, he tells the disciples that they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue. Now, that's different than, you know, being thrown out of a local church, and hopefully nobody's ever thrown out, but, you know, put out sometimes because they have to in order to bring them to repentance or sins. But they just can't go to another synagogue and become a member like, you know, just walk down the street. There's another church down there. You can just go to there, right? Now, if you're thrown out of the synagogue in Israel, that means you are cast out of the nation. You are an outcast. So they were going to be cut off from Israel. They would be as outcasts on the run for their lives from those who are the most dangerous kind of people, those who wanted to kill them because they thought they were serving God. You know how sometimes people get religiously zealous. There's a lot of things that have been done in the name of God that are not good. Jesus says that hardship and hatred is the cost we must be willing to pay. So the question he asks us this morning is this, are you willing to pay this price? Well, if, if you're a believer here this morning, you are willing You've already enlisted in the ranks of our Lord Jesus Christ on these terms. Now, you didn't sign up because of the hardship, because of the hatred, and Jesus isn't saying that's the reason why you do this. He just tells you that's what you can expect. The reason why you signed up, the reason why you closed with Christ and you trusted Him was because you loved Him, because you love who He is. 
because you love what it is He offers to you, that prospect of heaven, that blessedness of the Holy Spirit, that peace and that joy that would be yours because the path that He calls you to walk on is the right path. It's good. What He calls you to do is, is what you want to do because He's changed your heart. You signed up because there was nothing else you could do. Nothing else would satisfy you. You look at all these difficulties and you say, you know what, it's worth it because of the love of Christ and because of the love that I have for Him. That is what I want. So the reason why you can face the hardship, the reason why you can face the hatred and the difficulties is because you love Jesus Christ and you wouldn't have it any other way. If that's the way they're going to treat Him, that's the way they're going to have to treat you because you want to be like Him. That's the only thing you can do. But now Jesus says to the rest of you who are not following Him this morning, who haven't been willing to pay this price, that if you would go after Him, you need to realize that the Jesus of the Bible is not offering you the condo. He's not offering you the money. He's not saying it's going to be, well, you know, everything's going to be great in this world. You know, you're going to have health and wealth and everything you want. Everybody's going to love you. Sometimes people represent Christianity that way. But, but you know, like a tiptoe through the tulips or whatever, you know, but it's a hard road. It's a hard road. And if you want to follow Jesus, that is the price you must be willing to pay. But, of course, before you're going to be willing to pay this, you have to see that it's worth it. But it is worth it. I mean, think about this. You may have to suffer for a little while here on earth, but you will escape an eternity of suffering in hell. And you will enjoy the joy and the happiness that He gives in heaven forever in a relationship, the only relationship that exists in creation that will fill your heart with more love than you have ever known. As a matter of fact, we get to experience that while we're on earth. We don't have to wait to get to heaven for that. We get to experience the love and blessing of knowing Him, the joy and happiness of having His Spirit in our souls, and also that fellowship we get to enjoy with one another as people who belong to Him. If you're not following Jesus, but that is what you want, Jesus says you need to turn from the world, you need to turn from your sins, and you need to look to Him in faith. You need to trust Him and be willing to endure and suffer whatever hardship, whatever hatred you must to follow Him. And if you're willing to take Him on these terms, then He will be with you. He will bless you. He will fill you. He will sustain you. He will give you all that He has promised to keep you to the end. By the way, I also told you this evening that Jesus does not just say, look, Follow me, it's going to be a hard road. There it is, get going. You know, and then uh, you're left on your own to try to make it to heaven. No, Jesus does it all. He gives you that perfect righteousness. He takes away all of your sins. He gives you His Holy Spirit, and His Spirit works with you and in the people around you to preserve you and to restrain them so that they don't do to you what they did here, at least not all the time. Sometimes people do die. As Christians, sometimes they do have to lay down their lives for Christ. We do read about it still. There are people who are martyrs. But most of the time that doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen because of the spirit that Jesus said he was going to give to his disciples to be their helper. Now, we're going to look at that this evening. For right now, let's, let's bow in prayer, and let's, let's, let's do a couple of things. Let's think about what Jesus told us here. Let's think about whether or not he's worth it to us and whether we're willing to pay this price, and whether we are trusting in Him, and we are following Him, and turning away from our sins, because we're preparing now to come to the table. And the table is for those who have taken Jesus on these terms. We can't and we shouldn't come to the table if we are not following Jesus, if we are not willing to pay this price, because we don't belong to Him. Coming to the table would actually be a sin on our part, Unless we have closed with Jesus, unless we're trusting Him, we shouldn't come to the table. But if we have taken Him on these terms, if we are doing what the Lord has called us to do, He wants us to know the table is for us, 
to refresh us and to strengthen us and to give us more of his Holy Spirit so that we will be able to do what he calls us to do as those who shine the light in this world and bring that kind of fruit that will glorify the Father, that will prove we're his disciples, that will bring us joy because we're loving and serving the one who loved and died for us. So let's spend a few moments now in silent prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord if, you know, where we're at with him and let's prepare then to come to the table if we do belong to him.